Yeah, good. Yeah, so that's, that's so that is my title. So before I start, I would like to thank uh, organizers for giving this opportunity to come here and share with you some of our recent uh, works which we have carried out at IIT Delhi. Um, uh, I would also like to thank the previous speaker uh, for sharing some details on the systematics and more importantly, the experimental component. I'm going to do the very close to that, but in terms of theory. So that will make, uh, that will help me when I proceed. So, so, so as the plan of my talk, I'll start with the sharing with you very, some of these important ingredients related to atomic clocks, which will set a kind of a dais for my talk and also help me uh, uh, in getting, uh, get going through the talk. So we have done, we, we, have, done, we have done some work on uh, group 13 elements. So I'll be sharing some of those, those results with you. In last couple of months, maybe six months or so, we have started working on strontium atomic clock, highly charged ions. So we have some preliminary calculation that I would like to share with you. We have also worked on uh, super heavy elements, though they are not very, uh, they may not be very good for the atomic clock uh, context, but yeah, they have uh, in general very large applications. So I'll share few results with you. And next, I will be talking about uh, this uh, computational methods. But IT Delhi, what we have done is that we have developed series of couple cluster uh, theories and ports. So I will be sharing with you some of them very briefly. And then at the end, I will share some uh, results. So the strategy of our work is that we choose an appropriate atom ions, appropriate atom or ions that we choose, we can choose based on the experimental inputs. And then we apply uh, the appropriate many body methods. And when we do that, we can expect to have large implications. So some of the implications we look at IT Delhi, I have listed here. So we work in atomic clocks. That is the, uh, that is the context of my today's presentation. We know that the atomic clocks can be uh, important proof to the variation in the fundamental constants because astronomical objects, such as astronomical measurements suggest that the alpha varies maybe about one part in 10 power 16. And that is essentially the accuracy of the most of these atomic clocks. So it should be possible to trace the variation in the fundamental constant once we have the accurate atomic clocks. We do a lot of this spectroscopic calculation where we look at the fine structure, hyperfine splitting, electric dipole magnetic moments, and so on. So that is uh, what we can do as a very easily. We also look into this parity non conservation and parity and time reversal co conservation in our group. So the idea here is that when you have a precise calculation on these observables, on the parity and time reversal observables, then you combine those observables with the experiment and that can lead or that can tell us some, some insight to the physics beyond the standard model of particle physics. So that is another uh, area of the physics we look at at Delhi, and most importantly, developing new many body methods and codes. So what we do is that we, do, we, we develop some theories, we benchmark it, and then next time we look, to, look forward to prove it. So that is the biggest motivation for our work. Now, uh, yeah, I know for the last 10 days or so, a lot has been discussed and shared with the students, especially about the basics of the atomic clock. So I'm not going to go into the detail of that, but for completeness and to help my to help me in this my talk, I'll be just briefly mentioning about few things. So as we all know, the atomic clocks are the most accurate time measurement device in existence today, and they work on the essentially the basis of this atomic transition frequency. So you have energy level one, and then you have the energy level two. You can have this transition frequency, and that transition frequency is used as the time keeping device or time keeping parameter in atomic clocks. For example, if you look at this CCM atomic clock, which is the one is being used for civilian time or is operational globally, that has the inaccuracy of 10 to minus 16. And if you translate that into, in terms of time, that is equivalent to saying that the CCM atomic clock, that they're not going to lose or gain even one second in 300 million years or so. So they are so precise. And because of they are so precise, they have so many fundamental as well as technological applications. Some of the here I've listed them. I'm not going to go into detail uh, uh, of a typical atomic clock, as we all know, 
has two components. One is this oscillator, which generates the electromagnetic radiation. And there is this reference beam, which is essentially the atoms. Can be one atom or ion and the collection of atoms. So the idea here is that what you do is that you sign light uh, from laser to this reference medium. And uh, there, are, there are electrons which are going to be excited from one energy state to the another energy state. And you keep signing this laser until all electrons from one energy level get excited to the uh, upper energy levels. And that you can measure at the detector. And once that happens, then you lock the frequency of that laser to, do, to that certain frequency. And that frequency, the locked frequency, you can use as the time measurement parameter. So if you look into the, uh, this is essentially very important for me. So if you look into the accuracy of an atomic clock, so this is defined in terms of fractional frequency SIP, which is delta F by F0. So F0 is the atomic transition frequency. You have cesium, so that has certain uh, transition frequency between two levels. And delta F is the shift in the atomic frequency. So that what, what, what happens is that when you have the atom put in, in the complicated experimental setups, so this F0 is not going to be F0. It's going to be some change because of those different, uh, different uh, sources. And that we call this uh, environmental perturbations. So here I have listed some of them, some of them uh, uh, this sources which contribute to delta F. And remember, these are the systematic SIPs. The systematic SIPs, what we mean that we know where they come from, but we are unable to control them. So, so, so that is the idea. So uh, these are the general I have listed here. This will change. Some of them are dominant. In some certain case, some of them are less dominant. In certain case, depending on the it's iron or it's lattice clock, or depending on the experimental setup, they are going to vary. However, among all of them, for the room temperature clock, black body radiation shift, which is a kind of AC uh, second order star shift, that is going to be dominant for the room temperature clock. And that can be expressed in terms of this expression. So that is delta nu BBR is directly proportional to delta alpha, where delta alpha is the difference of the polarizability of the two states. And of course, there is a the temperature. So the idea here is that if you know the change in the polarizability, we can estimate the BBR shift. And it is non-trivial to measure this experimentally. I need to discuss with the previous speaker, how do you measure it so precisely and what are the challenges. But what I know is that it is non-trivial to measure experimentally. However, if you have sophisticated or precise many body theories, you can calculate it very precisely. And that's where we come into the picture. We calculate delta alpha for the different atomic clocks or the prospective candidates, and we estimate the BBR shift. So yeah, so as we all know, there are several hundred atomic clocks which are being developed, which are being considered globally. But for us, uh, we have taken some of them uh, as our interest. The first one is this group 13 elements. I told, that, I told in the beginning that we have done some calculations. So group 13 elements, they are reported to be very, very accurate uh, atomic clocks. If I can give you the example for this aluminum plus, so, so, so the, it, it has a very high frequency of about 1100 terahertz. That means F0 is very high. So you can expect it to be more accurate. Uh, the BBR shift here is reported to be almost 10 times smaller than any other accurate atomic clock. It has very small, this natural line width. That means the frequency measurement you can expect to be very precise. And the latest reported this uh, uncertainty from the NIST is of the order of 10 to minus 19. However, it is accurate, so it is accurate, but we have to pay the price. There are experimental as well as theoretical challenge. Experimental challenge is here. So the clock transition is from one is zero to six to zero. Now it's a J is equal to zero states. So the magnetic moment is zero. So it poses challenge in terms of experiment because this transition is insensitive to the electromagnetic radiation. So what they do is that it's called the quantum logic clock because so they cool trap this aluminum along with some other ion, which has a non-zero magnetic moment. So that is a kind of challenge. In terms of theory, it is challenging because these states are non-trivial to calculate because it has a two valence electron. So there's one electron in 3s, another, another electron in 3p. It poses challenges, and when I move, uh, on, I will 
tell you a few points. I'll share a few points why it is challenging. As I said, since last six months or so, we have we started looking at the strontium atomic clock. And in fact, we are collaborating with uh, uh, this ICER Pune group by Makant. So here also, uh, the clock transition is very similar to aluminum. It's between 1 to 0 to 3 P0, but they are lattice clock. So the some challenges were here. They are kind of uh, resolved here, but we have the another different, uh, different type of challenges. Now this is, so it's uh, uh, 698 nanometer. Now again, it's a dipole forbidden transition. If you look from here, it's a dipole forbidden transition. So the way it can happen, uh, we can expect for the two different channels. If it is the estrontium 87, that is fermionic, then uh, this 1H0 can be connected to 3P0 through hyperfine induced interaction. That means first 1H0 can be connected to 1P1 or 3P1 through E1 transition, and then 1P1 or 3P1 can decay back to the 3P0 by hyperfine interaction. If it is bosonic isotopes, let's say like estrontium 88, where the nuclear spin is zero, then uh, the same, this transition can happen through the two photon channel, what we call as the E1M1 channel. That means E1 connects 1H0 to 1P1, and then it decay back to 3P0 by M1 channel. So we have examined both of these channels in terms of calculation. I will share some preliminary results. Now, uh, yeah, so this is, uh, we feel that this has a large prospect uh, in future to come, highly charged ions. And as a part of this DST CRG project, we have taken some initiative in this direction. So the advantage with highly charged ions in the context of atomic clock, I have written some of them. So the general advantage is that in highly charged ions, you have the stronger nuclear potential because you have the uh, more number of protons, the nuclear potential is strong. And because of the stronger nuclear potential, the electronic orbitals, they are sink, kind of shrunk. And they are so shrunk and they are so attached with the nucleus that they are less insensitive to the environmental perturbation. So in general, we can expect we can expect these systematic errors to be smaller in the case of highly charged ion. So that is the uh, in general the biggest advantage. And most of these highly charged ions, they are reported to have very long life time for the metastable states. So they are kind of applicable for the quantum computing application. They are also reported to be very sensitive to the variation in the alpha. So considering that in mind, we started our uh, journey with this aluminum 13 plus clock. So that is a kind of one valence system. It's uh, not very complicated for us in terms of theory. So we, we started with this benchmark calculation and we have submitted this paper. And yesterday, one of my students, Palki, has a poster on this. So uh, uh, I hope some of you might have visited it. So we started with this. I'm not going to share any results on aluminum plus because this was in terms of uh, poster. However, we are working on this kind of atomic clocks like PR9 plus, where we started doing some calculation, although it's not easy. And the reason here is that, so the clock transition here is from 3P0 to 3G3, and it has, this meta stability has a very long lifetime, very long lifetime, and it is uh, 475 nanometer. So we want to probe this transition. Uh, this nature paper by PTB Germany and uh, uh, Netherlands and then uh, Max Planck uh, it'll work. So this has uh, experimental component as well as there are some calculations and we feel that we can improve those calculations using our theory. So that is one of the motiv motivation in looking to that. All, all right, so now I think I'm done with this, uh, my general uh, introduction about the atomic clock, which will help me get going. Now, if you want to simulate this atomic clocks using a uh, theoretical method, then how do we do that? So I know there are students so as we all know, these atoms, for example, you consider the strontium or aluminum, they form a quantum mechanical system of interacting particles. So now they're interacting particles. And if you're looking for the quantum mechanical description for such system, you need two quantities, many body wave function and many body energies. And that you get by solving this differential equation, what we call as the Schrodinger equation. So if you consider a system like aluminum, the many body Schrodinger equation looks like this. So this I have put the simplified form of the Schrodinger equation. That's a non-relativistic form so that your student can follow. However, we use complicated Hamiltonian, what we call this Dirac Coulomb Hamiltonian, that is to account for the relativistic effects. So here, let me spend a, a minute or so to explain for the students. So this is the kinetic energy of the electron. 
This is how an electron interacts with the proton, and this is the electron electron interaction energy. There are some other interactions as well. So these are the dominant interactions. There are some small interactions, uh, like bright interaction, QED interactions. So they contribute about 1% to the properties. So I'm not going to uh, talk about that, but in our calculation, we do incorporate them as well. So now for this, for this Hamiltonian, solving this Schrodinger equation is extremely difficult. In fact, exact solution for aluminum like system is not possible. So what, and the reason for that is this electron electron interaction term. So you know that quantum mechanics tells, tells us that if you have a many body system, so the many body wave function is written as the anti-symmetrized linear product of the single particle wave functions. So now, while you have this term there, you cannot write the many body wave function. So the way to do is that you get rid of this term first. That is the thumb rule. And in fact, not in this atomic physics, any, uh, if you look at the condensed matter system also, uh, there also that is the approach. So we get rid of the electron electron interaction term first, and then later we look forward to include in our calculations. And that is what we do here precisely. So what we do is that we use what we call the independent particle model, which tells you that the, each electron in an atom moves in an average field of the nucleus and remaining electron. So using that average field, that average field in our case we use as a hartree fock field. Yeah, so using that average field, we can write this Hamiltonian into two parts. One is this H0, that is expressed like this, that is the kinetic energy of the electron, that's uh, uh, the energy of the electron, interaction of the electron with the potential and proton, and then this hartree fock average potential. So now if you look carefully, this has only Ri dependent. There is no Rij dependent. So this we can solve exactly and exactly like hydrogen atom problem. So if you have aluminum, essentially you need to solve this Schrodinger equation 13 times and then get the single particle wave function and write the many body wave function. So that is quite easier to do. We do this using self consistently using Dirac Fock uh, uh, method. This other term, which is VES, which is essentially this electron electron interaction minus this average potential. So this average potential, hartree fock potential, is one of the uh, uh, best suited average potential for the atomic systems. It takes care of the, uh, the most of the uh, most of the properties. So this VES as a result is smaller than this Rij. So this is small. So we can treat as the perturbation. You can simply use this many body perturbation theory, the one we have learned in quantum mechanics. But here, in our case, we use a little bit a uh, sophisticated theory, what we call this couple cluster method, which is more precise or uh, which is known to be one of the most reliable many body theories. So what I'm going to do next is that I'll just explain you briefly in a few minutes what is couple cluster theory. So couple cluster theory is very, very simple to understand for the non-export, but it is difficult for the export. So the idea here is that what you have the aluminum, so you have the core electrons, right? You have 13 electrons. So these electrons, they are going to interact among themselves. And in fact, they are going to repel. And you know that these states are all occupied. So the only way or the only place where they can go is to the excited states, virtual states, because they cannot go to these because they are already occupied. So they will, they don't want to violate the Pauli exclusion principle. So the only possibility is that they will go to that. Now, these excitations can be one electron at a time, can be two electrons at a time, are in principle, all electrons at a time. So for aluminum, all 13 electrons can be excited at a time to the virtual state. But, but we know that this electron-electron interaction is a two-body interaction. So the dominant contribution is going to be from T2. So to simplify the calculation, we mostly restrict ourselves to T1 and T2. So we excite one electron and two electrons. We also take care of the third electron in a different way. I'll, if needed, I'll discuss that. So now these are excitation. That means one electron is getting annihilated here, created here. So using second quantized notation in quantum mechanics, we can express that in terms of creation and generation operator. So this AA means this is uh, one electron from here is annihilated, and one electron is created in P state. Similarly for T2, and this operator we can simply uh, represent in terms of a diagram. So what we call the Goldstone diagram. So Goldstone diagrams they are a, kind of derived from the Feynman diagrams, but they have different set of rules. If needed, I can talk about that. So for example, T1, so the one electron is annihilating, other electron is creating. 
but T2, two electrons are getting annihilated from the core and they are treated to the virtual. Now, having known this, we can simply write our many body wave function, which is the exact wave function in terms of this operator T, what you call this excitation operator, or you can call it the couple cluster operator, exponential T acting on phi. Phi is the Dirac Hockey state, which we have solved just like a hydrogen atom. So we know the phi, we can operate this operator on this, and that will give us the exact wave function. And once we have the exact wave function, we can calculate the properties, whatever we want. So what we do is that, so, so to get this T, we have to work a little bit more. So we substitute that to the Schrodinger equation, derive some mathematical expression, and we get an equation for uh, equation like this. So these are called the couple cluster working equation. This is the simplest equation I'm showing you, but there are a lot more complicated equations. So for example, this is the equation for T1. When we solve it, you will get T1 amplitude. It is, has a T2 as well. This is the equation for T2. We solve it, we'll get T2, and they are coupled. So solving this equation is rather tedious if you work in terms of a real mathematics, because you know T1 and T2, they are already creation and relation operator. This HN is also expressed in terms of creation and relation operator. You put in terms of actual operator, equation is going to be very complicated. So what we do, we adopt the techniques which are based on this diagram. So we work out the diagrams, we calculate these diagrams and program them. That is what we do. So as I said, these are Goldstone diagrams. So if I can give you the idea, uh, yeah, please uh, interrupt me five minutes before. Yeah. So uh, yeah, so if I have to give you some idea that what do these diagrams mean, uh, it's not very difficult to understand. These are essentially the collection of integrals. For example, you consider one diagram. So the A, B, P, Q, R, S, they are just the single electron states, 1s, 2s, 3s, and so on. Uh, these dotted lines represent the Coulomb interaction. So for example, these two electron R, S, they are interacting with this P, Q electrons. So Coulomb integral, so Coulomb matrix element, this you can write as the terms of integrals. These are the initial wave functions, these are the final wave function, you have the Coulomb operator. This is also operator T2, so this is this. So this diagram has this much expression, where this PQRS, they run from 1 to 150. So the basis we have, let's say, 1 to 150 or so. So in, 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 as a result, we have a billions of these integrals which we need to solve to get couple cluster wave function. OK, so this is one uh, a paper which I, I, I'm very proud to share with you. So this is uh, uh, essentially a code uh, on the, so he says that photon code on relativistic couple cluster pro cell and one valence. So, so this, uh, so we have developed codes uh, for a series of uh, different types of atoms. And in this paper and this code, what we have published this couple cluster code up to closed cell and one valence system. So, uh, uh, yeah, so this is there and it is free for, uh, it is available for use for the community. If you are interested, you can just download this code from the CPC website and you start using couple cluster. You don't have to be expert in couple cluster. So it is, it is, it is very uh, well written manual and the code, it is self-explanatory, you can use it. However, if you still have some question, please don't hesitate to write us. Now, what was, so, so, so the couple cluster closed cell and one valence, it is explored very well uh, in the community. But what was not, uh, what was even, uh, what was more challenging for us and which is not explored much is this couple cluster for the two valence system. And you need this theory because wherever you have this kind of clock transition between you have the, this uh, atomic issues function like this, this uh, coupled angular momentum states, you need this theory. So let me explain in a minute. Uh, what is the difficulty? So the difficulty with two valence couple cluster theory, what we also call the multi-reference couple cluster theory. So multi here, I'm not saying because it's just only two. So, so now you have these core states like aluminum, you have the virtual electrons. Now in this, you have these two valence electrons, right? So now the possible transitions could be more. So this core can go to the valence, core can go to the virtual, as well as valence can go to the virtual, right? So there are additional electron correlations which arise because of this, the presence of the valence electrons. And that's the uh, uh, reason for the complexity. In general, there's uh, the Movis multi-reference system. The dirac Fock state is not known. So since dirac Fock state is not known, you cannot just apply the excitation operator. First, you have to calculate the dirac Fock state. So that is the other uh, thing. And there is something called intruder states. 
So uh, I'm not going to go into that detail. So intuitory states, there are intuitory states, and because of that, very often the couple cluster calculations diverge. So these are some of the challenges which uh, is not for you, it is for us. So, 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 so having all this, we can write this two-body, uh, two-electron wave function like this. Now this you are familiar with. This now we have S1, S2, you have R2, and then this is the Dirac Fokker states. So again, we work out complicated theories, complicated codes, and then we get this wave function. So these papers uh, talk about the development of this theory. Now, just to give you an example, uh, so this, yeah, so we, 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 we show the calculation and we, we give you the numbers up to maybe two decimal place, three decimal place, right? But they are the result of very involved mathematics, very involved code, and maybe you may want to appreciate. So I have shown you one moderately sized diagram here. So this is kind of very simple diagram. And this is how we calculate. One of my students has calculated. So see, it's a two page. And if you see this number, for example, these are angular momentum, J plus JB. In, if, if it becomes J minus JB, then it is going to screw up everything for us. So we have to be very, very careful while working out these diagrams. And so far, we have worked about 1,000 diagrams at various stages of couple cluster uh, development. Now, uh, this is not, again, a very uh, of importance for you. So it's not just enough to arrive the theory, write the program. However, your program should also be efficient enough. I have five minutes. Oh, just five minutes. OK. OK, so I will complete. OK. So, so yeah, so this is, uh, I'll skip it. So our codes are very efficient. We do a lot of uh, sophisticated algorithms. Now, let me share some results, uh, the one we have obtained. So the, the first result is this alpha for the group 13 elements. So the, it's one S state. So these are the various stages of our theory. These are some published results. And if you look carefully, for example, aluminum, these numbers look very similar to that, right? But if you examine it, there, there is a difference. And the difference between these and this is about 2.1%. And remember, we are looking for the very precision calculation. So this 2.1% has a lot role. And so, so, so this our calculation is 2.1% different than previous calculations. And the reason for that is that our calculation is more uh, uh, more accurate in terms of electron correlation. It includes bright, QED, and perturbative triples. So this, I leave it here. Of course, we can look into the various electron correlations, where it comes from, which electrons contribute most, and why. So that is uh, details about that, that thing. Uh, this is also important. So this is the alpha for the neutral atom. So now you have the aluminum. So instead of aluminum plus, now here the state is 2p half. And, and for the indium, again, it's p half. It's a different system, and couple cluster theory is going to be very different. So that also we have developed, and here we have this series of methods we have adopted. These are our results. These are the previous results. Now, if you look carefully, uh, our results, for example, look at the indium aluminum here very uh, 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 broadly. So this is within the experimental range of this uh, previous, uh, from within the experimental range, and also uh, in the consistent with the experimental calculation. However, there are difference. Uh, at the uh, deep level, which we have talked about this these, 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 uh, paper. So if you have such methods, this one valence method, uh, it will be easier for us to uh, contribute to some of these ongoing efforts in India, like this uh, uh, YB plus atomic clock, which is taken care by uh, Subhadeep. This YB plus again at the NPL, we have talked yesterday by so Subhasis uh, Panja. And then we have this rubidium and calcium clock, which is at IIT Tirupati. Uh, taken by uh, Arjit. So this method has the potential to contribute into that. Uh, this is what uh, the meta-stable state for aluminum. So as I said, it is not allowed through dipole, but it's allowed from the, through the hyperfine induced transition. So we have calculated the lifetime of this meta-stable state using couple cluster theory. And so let me share. So this is, I can get it off. It's energy, not very important. So this is the result for the lifetime of the 3P0. Now look here, this is the experiment. 20.6, our result is very close to this. There is a one result from the calculation, it's the MCDF. Our result is very close to that, and our calculation has 0.5%. So that is what, again, I can, there are various statistics, various electron correlations, not very important for this forum. Yeah, I said, so we are looking for the strontium. Uh, we have done some preliminary calculation. Let me show in one go, which I'm running out of time. So these are the energy, we start with the energies. So you see here, uh, energies for these, they are 
they have this error, they are okay. But one P1 has large error of about 3%. That has to be uh, re-looked into that. We are looking into that. Uh, the oscillator strength for this transition is, I think, a very good in agreement with the experiment. We have also calculated these hyperfine constants. So except one P1 uh, for others, it can be considered as okay because the systems are complicated to deal with. M1 transition rate we have calculated because we say it is applicable to strontium 88. And these are our results. These are the previous results. We didn't find any experimental results. So these are also okay. Um, as I said, we are collaborating with Umakan's group. So what they're doing here is that, maybe two, two minutes, two minutes, okay. So, so what we're doing here is that, so, so they have this uh, cooling cycle from 1H0 to 1P1 and then back to 3P1. But what, while doing so, some of the atoms escape this cooling cycle and they are trapped to this 3P1 state and 3P0 state. So they're using this repumping uh, scheme to uh, uh, repump these atoms from this to this and from this to this, and then get them back again to 3P1 so that this cycle is complete. So they wanted us to examine some properties of this transition 3P0 to 5S, 5D, uh, 3D1. So they wanted us to look into theoretically and, and, and so that we can give, give some inputs to them. So we have done several calculations for them. And here I show you very important, some, some important one. So what we calculated is this uh, transition line width for this transition. Our result is 12.6. 12, 12 Their measurement is 18.1. So, so, so there is a, it's not very bad because we have the scope to improve on this. We are doing on that. Hyperfine, magnetic hyperfine constant is in excellent agreement. This uh, quadrupole hyperfine constant, this is also in ex excellent agreement. Okay, so this is uh, something super heavy element. I spent just maybe one minute. So as I said, super heavy elements, they may not be important for the atomic clocks. I don't know, I need to check, but they're certainly important for so many other applications. And for the simple reason that that they, you have the large number of uh, protons and electrons. So, so the relativity effects become very, very dominant in the super heavy element. And they are so dominant that you cannot predict, you cannot predict the properties of the super heavy element based on the other elements in the same group. For example, you cannot predict properties of CN based on the properties of uh, ZN, CDN, Mercury, because you, this is going to have large relativity effect. So, so, so again, here the challenge is that uh, experimentally, they're challenging because they have a very short lifetime. It's difficult to measure their physical properties because you need a state of the art, art single atom technique. Theoretically as well, they're challenging because we have the so many electrons. So we have to deal with that. Your method should be very, very sophisticated. So uh, let me, so we completed two projects. One is the CN NH plus organization. That is for this group and other for this YB and NO. Uh, YB and NO here, they, are, they belong to the same group. So we, we calculated these properties uh, using couple cluster. So this I can skip. Okay, so this is the polarizability just for the, ah, ah, yeah. Ah, so this, this, this you mean this one? Ah, it's a correlation energy. So here we have calculated for the super heavy element. Here we have calculated for the lighter homologue because we want to first benchmark our calculation with the existing data. So here for the lighter homologues, there are calculation we have compared so that we can say that what we are getting here is uh, maybe reliable, right? So, yeah. So, so let me show you the polarizability because the polarizability is the parameter of interest for my today's talk. So the polarizability for novellium, CN, NH plus, and organization. Again, there are, uh, there are these uh, uh, theory values. And if you look carefully, there is a large variation in this theory values. For example, if you look here for the, uh, uh, CN, there is a large variation. So this 25, 28, large variation in this uh, uh, values. So we examine that, and these are our calculations. Uh, I would make a statement they are more accurate than previous theories values. If there is a question how and why, I'll answer that. So this is what we have done. Uh, OK, so again, we can look into the electron correlation. We find that for CNNH polarizability contribution, more than 50% comes from the valence state. That is expected because valence electrons are more tend to polarize when you apply the electric field. For organization, it is very diff different. 95% contribution come from the 3P, uh, sorry, 7P 3 by 2, which is also the valence. So it's a very different trend for the organization. Uh, okay, so this is my summary. So I hope, uh, I, I, I just, uh, in this short time, I was able to convince you that uh, 
doing atomic theories are also not easy. If you are really doing from the scratch, then probably they have the same level of difficulties and challenges as the atomic experiment because you're doing a lot of these. Uh, so these programs, the one I talked about, they are about 100,000 lines program. And out of these 100,000 lines, you are expecting a number which is correct up to three decimal place. Uh, so that is quite challenging. So, so that I, uh, uh, we sincerely accept that. Uh, so we have developed a series of methods, I said, pro cell one valence, two valence, and using those, we can look at the several properties like energies, excitation energies, electric dipole, or magnetic dipole, quadrupole transitions, different spectro uh, spectroscopic properties, electric dipole polarizability, NSI, NSD, PNC, and so on. So depending on our interest, our need, these codes can be tuned, can be modified to, 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 to calculate those uh, properties. So yeah, so I uh, thank you for your uh, patience. So, I thank the collaborators. So this, this work essentially is done by, uh, in the collaboration with Professor Dilip Pangom, who was at, at PRL. At present, now he has moved to Manipur University. And uh, the students, Ravi, uh, Suraj, and Palki, they contributed to uh, that. Other students, other my collaborators, they are from, from the condensed matter physics. So I also work in the condensed matter area where we use this DFT calculations and all to look into the condensed matter systems. Yeah, thank you.